I got a very interesting comment here. Um, some very good questions, very polite, very well mannered from an agnostic. And uh, I really do appreciate the spirit in which these questions are asked. And I'm going to be answering these questions. I'm going to take a, a few minutes to do this here to explain what is a King James Bible believer. What does that mean? Because um, that's really the, the whole issue here. Um, but no idea of male, female, what age here. I have no idea. Um, that's fine. I don't need to know that. But uh, just wanted to go over this. I'm going to be putting the comment up here, screenshot of it up on, on the screen. I'm going to be answering these questions. Okay, here we go. Mr. Denlinger, I came across your videos and was quite intrigued by your videos. I have been listening to these for about three weeks. I have some questions and I am wondering if you are comfortable answering these. Do you have an email through which uh, we may correspond? Well, as I've stated before, uh, private email. Yes, I do have a private email. Do I give it out? Not very often, simply because there's a whole lot that comes in and I just can't handle it all. I type with two fingers, sometimes maybe my thumb, you know, if I'm feeling really skilled, but I, I don't do email very well. Um, and there's other people that have these same questions. So I asked this individual, I said, would you mind if I did a video? And they said, absolutely, that'd be great. So here we are. And uh, certainly I'm comfortable answering these questions. Number one, what do you consider the most important core beliefs and doctrines of your religion? Um, well, uh, let me give you a scripture on that. Uh, go here to it quick. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as, as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now I wore this t-shirt for a reason. This was sent to me by a friend of the ministry. Appreciate it. Thank you. But uh, this describes what I am and what those who follow this ministry are. Um, I am not the head of a cult or anything else. I am just simply someone who believes what I've received. Okay, That's the important distinction that's going to separate myself and other King James Bible believers from other Christian denominations or, or other religions out there. Um, and here's the thing. Okay, you as an agnostic, I believe agnostics are a lot more respectable. They're truly scientific in that they're saying, I, you know, at this point don't believe in God, but I'm not sure. I'm, you know, I want to see evidence. Okay, that's truly a scientific uh, way of doing things. An atheist is somebody who has their mind made up. The problem with an atheist is for you to be able to say, I have proven that God does not exist you need to be able to scientifically prove the non-existence of him, which the only way to do that is in a closed system. Okay, I, let me say it this way. Uh, here's a spindle of blank CDs, okay? Blank CD R's here, or whatever they are. Um, now, I have them in this system here. It's a closed system. So I can make a statement, how many CDs are in this thing here, okay? I'm holding it in my hands, I can view it, I can look at it, I can tell you exactly what's going on here. All right. For you to be able to prove scientifically that God does not exist, you would be able to say that you have full knowledge of all that goes on in the universe. You can't do that. So the real true scientific uh, way to say things is just to say I'm an agnostic. I don't know one way or the other. I want to see proof. Not a problem. I have no problem with that. Of course, you know, there is the danger there and that trying to find God scientifically is going to be an issue because you come to God as a sinner. You come believing in this book, but that's another issue. We won't get into that right now. But think of this thing. The reason I believe the King James Bible is for two very basic reasons. Okay, first of all is revelation. I read this book and God reveals things to me you know, supernaturally through the book. I, I read it and I say, okay, is that true? And, and he'll show it to me. Um, my life has changed dramatically as a result of my personal uh, faith in Jesus Christ and belief in this Bible. And I've seen the change happen in other people too that I don't know, that I've never met personally, that I don't control them or anything else. The same changes are there in their lives. 
Um, so that's one reason. The other reason is just simply because of logic. I do believe, I'm a very firm believer in things being logical or, or I reject things that are not logical. Okay, so here's the thing. This book works in you that believe. Now, if I come out and I say, as a King James Bible-believing Christian, that this book is God's book. This book was written by God, basically written by men, but God inspiring them to write down you know, what's written in this book. Now, if I hold to that, then I can't believe that this book contains any errors in it. Otherwise, God makes errors, and I'm smarter than him, and I can correct them. Okay, See, most professing Christians do not believe. They'll say that this is God's word, and then you say, is it perfect? They say, no, it's not. Now, that's not logical. See, I look at that thing from a purely scientific standpoint. If you tell me that this product will work, and I say, well, have you ever used it? No. Do you believe it will for you personally? No. That's not logical. For me to call myself a Bible-believing Christian, I need to believe in the book that I preach out of. Now, that's my stand that I take. I believe that this King James Bible is perfect and without error. I believe that this comes directly from God, Almighty God. All right? And, it, you know, I can't get into all the details of that thing. But this is my standard. I'll show you another verse. 1 John chapter 5. Again, See, I'm not going to stand here and just give you my opinions and beliefs and my feelings and, and how, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's what does Scripture say. That's the thing here that you need to learn. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. What's my revelation about Jesus Christ? Well, I have a feeling that there was a guy that named Jesus, and I just kind of think about him and whatever. No. What does the Bible say? What does the King James Bible say about Jesus Christ? See, again, written scripture. So, to answer your first question, what do you consider the most important core beliefs and doctrines of your religion? Um, the book. Right here. And, of course, you go into many of the doctrines within scripture. Uh, that comes after simply saying, I believe that this is God's book, and I believe that Jesus Christ was real. He was a real man, is a real man. And that he came to earth and that he lived a perfect sinless life. The only man that's ever been able to accomplish that. And he was murdered because of it. <laughs> and uh, people can't stand you if you're, if you're holy and righteous and things. They don't like that. Because you're, by doing that, you're shining light on them not being righteous. So they killed Jesus Christ. And his death, the blood that he shed there, he was buried and he rose again. If he could have shed his blood and died and was buried and that was it, well then he wouldn't be worth following. All right? He died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day, just like he said he was going to, just like the Bible prophesied that he would. Again, Scripture. Jesus Christ, when he was here on the earth, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. Now, if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I need to have a copy of those Scriptures. And today, it's this King James Bible. That doesn't mean that God can't use, you know, another foreign language translation or whatever else, but I believe, again... Another belief that I have is that the Lord will get every language to a point, I shouldn't say every language, but he will get languages to a point where he says, okay, this is my word, that's the one you stick with. All right, and of course it doesn't. God's not required to have a perfect Bible in every language because he didn't do that with the Old Testament Hebrew and he didn't do it with the New Testament Greek. So the whole Bible coming together in one volume, he doesn't have to have a perfect edition in everybody's language. He's never done it that way. So, you know, I, I need to go into some of this to just prove what I'm saying. So, core beliefs and doctrines um, all have to line up with the King James Bible. We're going to get into why there are differences between groups here as we continue. Um, <clears throat> number two, if you are a creationist, do you allow for evolution? Also, are you a young earth creationist? Well, what does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches that God created the heaven and the earth in the beginning. So, I can't believe in evolution all right and of course you know you can get into the debate well what about um you know changes within the same species or whatever else and stuff i'm not going to play the little word semantics and things like that uh evolution as it is defined by uh so what would call be called macroevolution, where you have uh, non-living 
um, material being converted somehow into living um, organisms. I don't believe in that. Uh, I do not believe in the Big Bang Theory. Um, certainly not. Uh, young Earth creationist? Well, what does the Bible say? See, again, we're back to the King James Bible. I'm not going to go with scientific theories or things like that um, because, and again here, if science contradicts, you know, some kind of science out there, branch of science contradicts what this Bible says, I'm going to go with the Bible. King James Bible believer. King James Bible, the Holy Bible above all the rest of the writings of men. That's why I put that banner up. Uh, again, let me show you a scripture on that. Um, first Timothy, I think of Thessalonians, first Timothy, um, chapter six, verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, the word of God, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. So if I try to go with modern day science, oppositions of science falsely so called, uh, because evolution is directly opposed to what this book says. Um, absolutely. And if I go with that, then I'm going to be erring from the faith, the Bible says here. So I really see no scientific grounds for most of the tenets of evolution. And I say most of the tenets because um, if you move to a northern environment and you're from down south and you eventually get used to the very cold winters up here, um, you haven't evolved, really. Uh, you've adapted to that environment. And, then, and you see, you play little word games back and forth. Well, adaptions on the micro level lead to macro evolutionary changes and all this stuff over all this time, you know, millions and millions of years. I reject all that stuff, okay? Um, yes, God has created, um, you know, different animal species and things like that uh, to adapt to their environment, but that doesn't change them into a different uh completely different kind of an animal or something um, so yeah and I mean I, I know that you can really get into a big debate on this thing but that's what I'm saying for now on that thing uh, ver or, yeah verse three number three whose thoughts most influenced your own ideas and philosophy besides the Bible well uh, I understand what you mean by philosophy but uh, you got to be careful of that um, just show you here real quickly again going to the scriptures as my final authority uh, just gonna uh, you know and I need to make this point here Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ and I read that for a very important reason it says philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men um, what I have discovered in many years of being in ministry now and being raised within Christian type churches and things, a lot of what I believed was traditions of men. Those were philosophies that men brought out. Uh, so I was very heavily influ influenced by a lot of the Baptist traditions of men. Um, I was raised independent Bible. I was not raised Baptist. Uh, but a lot of the traditions and things of men that have come in and appear nowhere in Scripture, um, you look at those things and you just go, you know what? I reject that now. Uh, that's why I am against church buildings. I'm against the whole Sunday best suit and tie thing. These things appear nowhere in Scripture and many, many other things. Um, so in answer to the question, whose thoughts most influence your own ideas and philosophy besides the Bible? Well, again, you know, um, there have been teachers and things like that. Uh, Peter Ruckman, you know, just pull the thing back here. He's actually the one that drew this right here. Um, Dr. Peter Ruckman, I have all of his commentaries and things. I've watched a lot of his videos, um, but I certainly don't agree with him on, on all points. Uh, no Bible-believing Christian would. Um, we'll have differences of opinions among ourselves, and that's fine. Uh, again, it's the Bible that's the final authority. I'm going to be driving that point home over and over again here. Um, the Bible is the final authority, and... You're never going to have somebody that gets up and is completely perfect in understanding of this Bible. Um, if you're attracted to high levels of intellect, uh, you're kind of barking up the wrong tree there. Um, 
Let me show you that one real quickly here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You've got to be careful of the intellectual thing. Uh, agnosticism is, is okay to a certain point, but if you're trying to find God through uh, PhDs, THDs, THMs, honorary doctorates, the whole deal, you're not going to find the Lord there. Uh, those guys are the ones that get messed up and are the ones that promote the heresies. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath, God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God is never going to give any man complete understanding of this book. And so as a Bible-believing Christian, you come out and you say, okay, I believe that this is God's book. I'm not going to go and say, well, certain parts, you know, it's God's book as long as it's translated accurately. <laughs> you know, you'll hear that one. Uh, no, I believe it's God's word. I believe that this book is directly from God, and my relationship to God is going to be based upon this book, not church traditions, be they Roman, Catholic, or Protestant, whatever. No, this book, this book is my final authority. And when you do that, you're going to find errors in what anybody teaches. I've had to come out numerous times and say I was wrong for teaching whatever because the Lord shows me more things, more truth, and, and I go, oh boy, I was teaching the wrong thing. And, and it, you know, and you're faced, you're faced with a decision at that point in time of, okay, you know, should I come out and be honest and say I made a mistake? Or should I just kind of cover it up in my pride and just act like I didn't do anything wrong? You know? So, um, you know, there are preachers that have influenced me and things, but uh, I don't put them up on a pedestal where they're above the Bible to answer your question. Um, number four, what makes your own interpretation of the Bible more valid or more truthful than, say, a pastor of an Anglican, Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, or Reformed congregation? Okay, my interpretation of the Bible as opposed to an Anglican. We'll just say that. Well, the Anglicans believe in baptismal regeneration, among many other things, meaning that they believe that a baby should be baptized to remove the stain of original sin, exactly as the Catholics do. So they baptize babies, they confirm them into the church and things like that. And there's a simple thing you'll learn as a King James Bible believer. Just simply say, chapter and verse. Show me where any baby was baptized in any of the Pauline epistles. Or any of the Bible, for that matter. Nowhere. So, it's not about me being right. It's not about my opinions or my feelings over and above the Anglican. No, no. It's, does the Bible say it? Well, you see, church tradition, the church fathers, and think, I'm not interested in that stuff. Where is it at in Scripture? Again, if this book is from God, as I believe, then if he wants something done, it's going to be in here. All right? So, that's on that one. Catholic. <laughs> Where do I get started? Um, the Catholics openly teach that if divine tradition, their traditions say one thing and the Bible says another, you scrap the Bible and you go with their traditions. Again, I have you know, videos where they actually admit that. You know, um, I reject that. You look at the, the Catholic Church and you say, okay, they say that the true, well, the one true church is the Catholic Church. Chapter and verse, the word Catholic isn't in the Bible. And it was around before the first century too, by the way. It's a Greek philosophical term meaning universal, the word Catholic. So it was available there to Jesus and his disciples, and they never used the word Catholic. So don't tell me, well, the word was invented later on to describe the Christian church. It was there in the first century, and they didn't use it. All right? I see the word Pope, forced celibacy, sacrament, Eucharist, transubstantiation, nun, monk, monastery, convent, all this language of the Catholic church, and I look in my King James Bible, it's not anywhere there. So, what makes me right and them wrong? I have an authoritative standard and they don't. How about uh, Lutheran? Well, again, Lutheran. Uh, I'll give you another thing here that you can kind of go, hmm, about. Uh, 
give you a scripture on this one. Again, in 1 Corinthians... First Corinthians chapter three, verse four. Um, well, I'll start in verse three. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? What's one of the big attacks on Christianity from agnostics or atheists? They'll say there's so many divisions. Why are there so many different denominations and things? Paul's rebuking the same thing. Paul would agree with you. He's saying there's envying, there's divisions and things among you. Verse 4, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Okay? We're not supposed to have denominational names based on men's names. Alright, so you say, what about Lutheran? Are you a follower of Martin Luther? Absolutely not. Why? He's a man. He's just a man. And, you know, you say, well, what about King James Version? Well, that was a name that was given to the Bible, but it was actually called the Authorized Version. All right. And I don't have a problem with King James Version because, you know, it was a, it was a thing where the people, the common people, called it the King James Version to put some weight behind it there because they were being persecuted horribly by the Catholics and by a lot of the Puritans and things, too. That's why a lot of these Puritan things are still around where they'll say it's not the King James, it's the Geneva Bible. Well, the Geneva Bible was the Puritan's Bible. So, and the Geneva Bible is a good Bible, but it doesn't have the mark of God's purity on it like the King James Bible does. So, uh, Lutheran, and again, Lutherans have a bunch of things that they just, they basically reformed Roman Catholicism. They, they you know, it's like a piece of putty, and they took Roman Catholicism, and they kind of smushed it a little bit and said, there, Lutheran. You know, and the Lutherans have gone back to Roman Catholicism now. So, they're officially Catholic again. So again, that's why I would reject them. They have a lot of teachings, a lot of beliefs that do not appear in the King James Bible, just like the Catholics, just like the Anglicans. Uh, Presbyterians. Again, uh, the Presbyterians, they're not named after a man. There was never a man named uh, Mr. Presbyter or something like this. But the Presbyterians and Reformed, you have that there, Presbyterian or Reformed congregations, um, both of them are Calvinistic. Now again, you look through the Bible, and there's multiple scriptures. I'll just give you one. There's a lot of them. Um, Presbyterians, Calvinists, or excuse me, Presbyterians and Reformed are Calvinistic. Calvinism is a teaching, if you don't know, that uh, John Calvin came out and he had this thing of um, that uh, there are only certain people that Jesus died for, they called it limited atonement, and that, um, you know, they're the elect, and then you have the non-elect. And if you're one of the non-elect, then you can't possibly get saved ever. You know, sorry, it's never going to happen kind of deal. Um, and here's the problem with that. Again, read through the Bible, and you'll see this. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. It says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now, why would God command men to repent when they can't? See? So, again... Back to what I said at the beginning of this video, logic. It would it be logical to say, okay, I believe this King James Bible. Would it be logical for God to condemn certain people as non-elect, where they can't get saved, but yet command them right here to repent? Why would he command people to repent when they can't? You see? So that's why a Bible-believing Christian goes, no, sorry, uh, Calvinism is a heresy. All right. So I hope you, I answered that question. Uh, number five, you indicated that there were seven dispensations in history. Can you enumerate these? Um, basically, just to give you a real quick here, you have the Garden of Eden. It's number one. Then you have before the law. Okay, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, things like that. Then you get to Moses. The law is given. Okay, that's three. The law and the prophets are until John the Baptist. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is preached at that point in time. Why? Because the king is physically on the earth. Right? So the king, Jesus Christ, as the king of the Jews, is presented to the nation of Israel. They have a right, or they have the, the um, ability to accept or reject him as their king. 
They choose to, re to reject him and take Rome as their king. We have no king but Caesar. Real smart. And they've, they've uh, suffered more at the hands of Roman Catholics, which is the Roman Empire basically became uh, Roman Catholicism. And they have suffered more at the hands of the Roman Catholic system than any other system out there. Okay, and Islam is a creation of Roman Catholicism. Again, talked about that in other studies. So law and the prophets are until John. That's the fourth one. The fifth one is Jesus Christ dies on the cross, buried, rises again. And that begins what we would call the church age. Now there's, of course, you know, issues there. I mean, it's, it's, we're trying to describe something there and things. So that's why we use the term church age. But, you know, the, the church is just a called out assembly. There will be churches in the time of Jacob's trouble. There's churches in the Old Testament. Uh, so it's problematic, but you know it's you can understand the body of Christ, the time of the body of Christ when Jesus dies, buried, resurrected, you know comes up. You have the early part of the book of Acts. There they're transitioning from again the gospels being presented to the nation of Israel. You've killed your Messiah. Will you accept him? You have a chance here. They reject again. So now it goes, the gospel is pointed to the Gentiles at that point in time. It's transition. It's not two different dispensations. Again, a hyper-dispensationalist will make two different dispensations there. They'll say the gospel given to Peter and James and John goes to the circumcision. The gospel of the uncircumcision to the Gentiles is through Paul, and that is here. And it's two different bodies of Christ. That's heresy. Again, plenty of studies on this uh, where I've mentioned this whole thing. But, so the fifth one there is what we would call the church age. All right, I'm going to need two more fingers here. So you have number five is the church age. Number six is the time of Jacob's trouble. Number five ends with the catching away of the bride of Christ, the body of Christ there. The Christians leave, boom, and now it goes back to the, gent or the uh, Jews, to the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel had to be in their own country. The Jewish people had to come back to their land. A very major prophecy. I read books back in the 1800s where the people back there were kind of going, I wonder if this is ever going to happen. I wish I could see it in my day, everything else. And they died before Israel became a nation. We've seen it. Okay, 1948, Israel became that nation. So the stage is set. And we're in between. We're here in the fifth dispensation, so to speak. And we're going to be transitioning into that sixth one when the body of Christ leaves. Okay. So you have the sixth one there, you have the time of Jacob's trouble. All right, people call it the Great Tribulation. That's not actually correct. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. All right, and it's interesting because in that time period, there's a number given that everybody's going to be forced to take. It's 666. Number six. Interesting. Then the seventh one is the Millennial Kingdom. The thousand year reign of Jesus Christ physically on the earth. The premillennial coming of Jesus Christ. He comes at the end of the Time of Jacob's Trouble, and sets up his millennial kingdom. Seven. I have a whole study on that on my secondary channel. I would have put it on the main channel, but I got this, these uh, Tomorrowland people uh, put a copyright claim against me, and so I had to put it on my secondary channel, but you can look that up. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, number six. You indicated that all persons should return back to their habitations. Uh, no, I didn't say that. Does this mean that all Americans should move to their own country of origin? Um, no, I did not say that, you know, I mean, I could, you're saying you indicated. So, okay, I can technically understand what you're saying there. Um, I'm saying that the Bible clearly says that there are bounds of habitations that people are supposed to stay in. All right. Um, <clears throat> but your question is there, does, that mean, does this mean that all Americans should move to their own country of origin? Okay. Let me uh, give you the answer on that one. Again, from the Bible, not my opinions. Does the Bible give any kind of leeway to leaving the bounds of your habitation? Uh, yes. Genesis chapter 9. Um, verse 27. It says here... Uh, God shall enlarge Japheth, it's going to spread Japheth out, the white Europeans, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. 
Okay, so he's going to dwell in an area where the tents of Shem are. Okay, Shem is the father of the Orientals, and America is a Native American. The the Indian people, the indigenous people of America, are Shemitic. They go back to Shem, and so Japheth. The reason I'm here, the reason my ancestors came here, is because they had to flee uh, Bavaria, you know, and get away from a lot of the Catholic persecution. My ancestors were primarily Anabaptist, uh, Mennonite, and um, on my father's side. And they came here to America to escape the Catholic persecution, to be freer here, to worship the Lord freely. Um, I would gladly go back to Bavaria if um, things were more free there, if, you know, if it wasn't totally being destroyed through integration and everything else. Um, but I'm more free here, and I've been told that. Uh, by people in other countries, including Germany, that, you know, if I was over there, I'd probably be arrested for some of the stuff I preach. I'm sure I would be, you know. Um, so I'm here for the reason of the Catholic uh, integration and control of the uh, European countries over there. And uh, so um, that prophecy is does exist there. Uh, that's why I'm in America. Um, would I go back to Germany if I had an, an opportunity? Uh, well, if the right situation was there, yeah, I would. Um, it's not there right now, so I'm going to be staying where I have the freedom to be able to preach the Word of God. Uh, let's see. Number seven. One of the most prevalent themes in your sermons is anti-Catholicism. In your estimation, what do they get correct regarding Christianity? Well, they get a lot of things correct. Uh, they they say a lot of the right things and, and uh, come out with a lot of the right... Um, stands and things like that. But uh, Christianity is something that can be counterfeited. Um, you know, and it's not about, you know, let's find common ground. Again, from a logical perspective, as a scientist, as somebody that's in, interested in science and agnostic and things, okay, um, I want to have uh, some chemical formula created. Well, um, you know, I want to create, um, let's see, I'll, just, I'll use a, medic, a metal. Okay, I want to create copper. And I come in and I say, here you go. You say, what's this? What's well, nickel? It's, it's, you know, it has some, you know, similar elements to copper and things. And it's, they're both metals, after all. And they, no, 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 no. I want copper. Okay. Um, does the, the Bible standards, do, does Catholicism line up with it? No. Okay, then you abandon it. All right, you don't say, well, let's reform it because they get some things right or whatever else. Um, you know, again, let me show you a scripture on that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, verse 13 through 15. I've talked about this plenty of times in my studies. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ funny because the Catholic Church says that they have apostolic succession. Verse 14, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. All right, um, A true Satanist is somebody that will counterfeit uh, things from the Bible. They'll take things from Scripture. They'll come out as a professing Christian. That's a true Satanist. Not uh, some kind of Anton LaVey, Church of Satan, Temple of Set, whatever, you know, stupid nonsense. Uh, they will come out and they will counterfeit Christianity. And you look at what the Catholic Church is doing uh, with, you know, molesting little children and things like that. And, and just the, their scheming with politics and scheming with all the stuff that's out there in the world. And, and uh, the Jesuit order and everything else. I mean, it's just, they're a very, very vile organization. So if the Pope comes out and says that, you know, uh, we believe the Bible, you know, or something like this, you don't go, well, maybe we ought to compromise, you know. No, they're wrong. Uh, number eight, what is your own religious heritage? I mean, which churches did you belong to or attend in the past? Well, I said about that earlier. I'll just answer that again. Um, went to, was born and raised at Calvary Monument Bible Church. In Pennsylvania, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. I went there for till I was 17 years old. Um, from there, I quit and basically uh, quit going. 
and uh, basically was just working on Sundays and I didn't even really attend or anything. Got out of high school and, and uh, occasionally would visit uh, another church my parents were going to at the time. It was a, a Lampeter United Methodist Church. Went there a few times to visit, um, but never actively went there. Um, years and years and years went by. And after I got saved, I thought the Baptists were good and <laughs> had some things to learn. Um, went to Cornerstone Baptist Church, in, again in Pennsylvania. Uh, from there, I went to uh, Berean Bible Church. From there, I quit going again because I was just disgusted by the whole thing. And uh, No, no, I'm sorry. I went, to, I went from Berean Bible Church to Mount Zion Baptist Church um, in um, uh, Denver, PA, again, Lancaster County. Uh, from Mount Zion Baptist Church, I stopped because I just got sick and tired of it. They were basically saying that you had to, had to have background checks, police background checks to teach Sunday school. So I was like, okay, yeah, this is a little bit weird. And um, and I tried to you know get into teaching stuff there and things, and I just saw that the pastor was not a Bible believer. Um, and so from there, I, was, I took off about a year or two uh, from going to any kind of a church building. And then a friend of mine got me to go to Liberty Baptist Church. And so I was at Liberty Baptist Church for a while. Then we went into our house church because of big problems there too. Started a house church, Bible Believers Fellowship. And from Bible Believers Fellowship, I got married. My wife and I moved to northern, northwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, attended um, Country Chapel Baptist Church in Eldred, Pennsylvania. And uh, from there, that was the final straw for me. And I said, okay, you know, this whole church building thing is just not in Scripture. And I know why. It's a social club and the whole deal. So from there, um, we moved back down to Lancaster County. And then from there, moved here to Maine. And uh, the church that I'm a part of now is the Body of Christ. Um, so that's my heritage. Okay, And, I, and I'll say this too. I prayed a prayer thinking that that would save me. A little Sunday school thing. Easy believism. No idea what I was doing. And um, I was... You know, thought I was a Christian when I was eight years old. Was baptized in Calvary Monument Bible Church, and uh, just lived very wickedly uh, for the next. Will that be? Till I was twenty-five. I can't do the math right now. <laughs> Sorry, my brain's going. You know, but uh, you know, till I was twenty-five years old, I got saved and uh, really, truly broken at that point in time, and just tired of this world, and just like, okay, Lord. You know, I know you're real. Please, I want to be saved. Please, God, save me. And I cried out to the Lord in a truly broken, contrite spirit. And uh, and he saved me. And basically, I just started studying uh, just almost nonstop. And, you know, got to this point where the Lord got me into Internet ministry. Uh, first video ministry and then Internet ministry after that. Um, and that was when I was going to Liberty Baptist Church. The video ministry and then that turned into a YouTube channel and everything that's going from there. So that would be my answer to that. Um, number nine, you claim that other preachers are, I think you meant to say preachers, are not saved and they claim that you are not saved. How do you objectively make your claim that others are not saved while you are? Do you understand yet? What does the Bible say? You know, and um, I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, growing up in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, we had a property, and I've told this story before in other studies. But we had a property where, where we had a lot of different types of fruit, wild fruit, and things like that. We had uh, black cherry trees and things, and uh, mulberry trees, and we had a lot of raspberries and and whatever else. But I remember the very first tree I ever got to know the name of was the black cherry tree. You know why? Because it produced fruit. I was able to clearly see that's the black cherry tree right there, even as a very, very little boy, because I knew at a certain time of the year, it'd be covered in white blossoms all over that tree. And a little while later, there'd be these nice little green cherries hanging there. And wait a little bit longer, they'd start turning red. And then they'd turn a nice, really, really dark purple, almost black in color. And then I could go pick them. So I knew that tree by the fruit that it produced. And I will tell you right now that a Christian is going to be known by the fruit that they produce. 
there will be a changed life there. See, the thing that separates me from a lot of the other preachers out there is I believe that salvation is supernatural. They don't. They believe it's an action of the will. It's an action of your own. You, you just come to it with a theological understanding and you just go, yes, well, I believe this and whatever else. And then your life can change, but it doesn't have to change. Things might be different, but they don't have to be and all this other stuff. Uh, I believe that when you get saved, the Lord will shake up your life and stir up your life and major events will change. You'll see that your friends change. You'll see your interests change. Your whole life will change. And then when you sin, and you will sin as a Christian, um, it's going to bother you. There's going to be it's going to be a massive change. That's the whole thing. And again, read the Bible, read this book as your final authority, and show me in there where people that truly got saved, their lives didn't change. I mean, the Apostle Paul, our greatest example. Look at how his life changed. It was drastic. It was completely different. It's an amazing change. So. Um, what's the standard by which I can say other preachers are not saved? Well, I don't see that change, number one. Number two, I don't see chastening. The Bible says if you're without chastisement, you're a bastard, according to the book of Hebrews. A bastard is somebody who doesn't know who their father is. So I've seen people that preach very, very false doctrine. Again, they'll say things that aren't in this book. You know, take the Pope, for instance. He'll say all kinds of things and do all kinds of things that don't appear in this King James Bible, and yet God's not chastening him. He goes right on in his position of power. Why? By the Bible's own standards, he's not saved. See? I hope you're understanding that. It's about the book. It's about the authority of God's Word. I can't stand here before you and say, I believe that this is God's Word, and then turn around and say, but it should be corrected here, here, and here. If I believe and say and, and profess that this is God's Word, then I'm going to believe it's perfect. And I'm going to let this book judge me and tell me what to do. All right, number 10, finally here. Were there any early Christians you can point to who believe the same as you do? <laughs> you know? Um, yes, the King James Bible. But I understand what you're saying. You're saying what about church history and things like that. Well, again... If you study church history, you will see that when the New Testament is finished, about 90 A.D. or so, the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation. That was the final book that was written. Um, after that, you're going to have some of the early, early church you know, people writing and stuff that are called today church fathers. Um, they're going to have some doctrines right. They're going to have many times you know, a lot of them wrong. But you're going to have some of these early type of Christians but the whole thing is the Roman government at that point in time was persecuting Christians horribly. Um, again, 90 AD. Uh, what's the last book? What's the story of the last book being written? The book of Revelation was written by a man named John who was on the island of Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony that he held. He was put on an on island as a prison, essentially. Uh, much like Australia at one point in time was a prison you know, for the British Empire. They just take their prisoners out there and dump them on the island and have fun, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, try to survive. Well, that's what happened to the Apostle John. So Christianity is not some kind of a thing where um, they were sitting in nice little plush palaces writing these books and their servants, you know, they were, John took a break from writing the scriptures and clapped his hands and, you know, a waiter came in, you know, his butler came in with a nice, you know, cool glass of iced tea or something. You know, no, it didn't happen that way. He was in prison. Um, 70 AD was the destruction of uh, Jerusalem, like Jesus Christ, the temple in Jerusalem, like Jesus Christ had prophesied in Matthew 24. Um, so Christianity was persecuted, horribly persecuted. The Bible's finished, and for the next couple of hundred years, that Roman Empire is just going out and hunting down Christians, which they you know, were political enemies, essentially, because they were, they were basically telling the people to do things contrary to a lot of the Roman pagan system out there. Uh, you'll see that in the book of Acts. It was already happening in the book of Acts. So Roman, the Roman political empire, um, eventually they see we're not stamping Christianity out. So they have to merge and take their pagan gods and put 
Christian saint names to them and claim that uh, Peter was the very first pope. And so you have, I think it was Constantine basically came out with the thing of saying, instead of the, you know, Caesar of Rome, now we'll have the Pope, Pontificus Maximus, you know, title used for both, essentially. And so from then on, you have Roman persecution of political dissidents that they would call terrorists today, essentially, which Christians are not terrorists, never have been, real ones. And so they persecute them in a political spectrum, and then they, they see we're not stamping Christianity out, so they come in with their own counterfeit version of it, Roman Catholicism. And then now, instead of going after political dissidents, they're saying these people are heretics. So you had a lot of the early groups, uh, Donatists, um, or one Paulicians, another. There was a different ones, and I'm not saying I agree 100% with what those people believed. But the whole point is the Catholics were going after them as heretics. Uh, the Waldensians were another one, the, the Vaudois, and there was a bunch of you know others. But these ancient Christian groups that were called heretics, and they basically lived and did very similar things to what I do today and other Bible believers do. And that is we don't attend established state churches. Uh, we shun that stuff. Uh, we're separate from a lot of the things of the world. We just, you know, live and and uh, preach the gospel to people, to those that will listen. Uh, we don't seek to control governments or anything else, uh, big political movements and things like that. Uh, we just, you know, live and let live, I guess is what you would say, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, in the political spectrum. Uh, we certainly want to change people's lives. We certainly want to help people. Um, but as far as trying to establish world governments and things like this, uh, Christians, nope, nope, not interested. Uh, so, um, and you say, where are the writings of these early Christians? Well, a lot of them were burned um, by the Roman, uh, secular Rome, and then now the political religious Rome that came after it, about the 4th century, the, there roundabouts, you know, when the Roman Empire merged with, well, not just say merged, when it became Roman Catholicism. And they burned the writings of the heretics as well as the heretics themselves. Again, you can read Fox's Book of Martyrs for more information on that. Uh, Martyr's Mirror, another one that you could read. Uh, so, um, and again, you know, just say this, another port, important point for me to make, this thing of antiquity. Antiquity seems to be this thing of, is if you can prove that, people believe the way you believe for the last 2,000 years. Uh, that's not a wise thing. Again, let's look at this thing logically. Um, how many centuries did people believe that mercury could cure disease? Many centuries throughout the Dark Ages. How many centuries did people think that raw sewage running down the street was not a problem? For many centuries, you know, even though they went through a lot of the plagues in Europe. Uh, people can do things for hundreds of years and it'd be wrong. All right, just looking at the thing logically, absolutely, okay? My standard is not church history. There were aspects of it there that, that do line up with what I believe and things. My standard is what does the Bible say? This book that came to us down through the, the centuries and things, what does this book say? All right, that's the standard. And, you know, I'll say this too. And that is, this is the oldest English Bible in common use today, all right? And as far as really impacting things, I know there are people that use the Geneva, which predates the King James, but they're really not accomplishing anything, to be quite frank. But this is the oldest English Bible. This one has changed the world. No, no book has ever been produced like this King James Bible. Um, but even if this King James Bible had been written a year ago, whatever else, if you put this book to the test and you live according to the precepts of this book, um, it's either going to produce fruit or it's not. It's just as simple as that. Either this book will change your life because it's holy scripture or it won't change anything. Um, I can tell you right now, if you put this book to the test and you approach it with, a, with saying, okay, I believe that this is your book, God, and I want you to reveal it to me. Show me. I'm not going to come to this book and question it. If I'm going to be a Christian, I'm going to believe that this book is God's perfect word. 
I'm not going to hold on to this for a little while till I find something better. I'm going to say this is God's book. This is God's standard. And you see, I'm the safest kind of a guy to deal with, by the way, too, among professing Christians. Why? Because I'm held to a standard. If you can come to me and you can show me, hey, Brian, uh, what you're saying there, I found a verse of Scripture that contradicts that. You see? I'm going to look at that and I'm going to go, hmm, it is for us today. It's, you know, dispensationally for us today. Uh, ugh. Yeah, hmm. I'm obliged to change. I can't just shift gears and say, well, you see, um, Irenaeus in the such and such century said such and such, so therefore I can overthrow. No, 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 no. Okay? Um, that's one of the reasons why the criminal system is so corrupt in this country, because you have court cases setting precedent and many times overthrowing established laws. Because, you know, Roe versus Wade, a good example, you know, let's, let's have a court case where we can make abortion legal through the court case. Wait a second, what does the law say? You know, the Constitution and things like that. I don't believe the Constitution gives give the grounds or the rights to abort a baby because you don't want it. I think that that's wrong. I think abortion is murder. I think it's a very wicked thing. But you have a court case that overthrows it. Well, it's the same thing in the Bible realm. This is the law. This is what we hold our standards to if you're a King James Bible believer. Okay? If you're somebody else, then you can just hold on to this and overthrow it whenever you want to. So, uh, I guess that's going to be it. I hope I've answered your questions uh, a little bit long-winded, but hey, you know, I'm going to be thorough with these questions. It's very, very good questions. So, I guess that's going to be it. Thank you very much for your respectful, courteous questions, and uh, I do appreciate that. And again, you know, let me just say this. I'm very rough on an atheist a lot of times because the Bible says the fool hath said in his heart there is no God. I understand, and it says it goes on to say they're corrupt, they're abominable. abominable. Um, that's why I'm rough on atheists because I'm trying to break through that self-righteous pride a thing of saying that they they don't believe in God and they you know they hate the concept of God and the whole the whole deal. I'm trying to break through that, and I use sarcasm sometimes and things. But if uh, if you ever meet me in person, uh, you that wrote the comment or anybody else, and you you sincerely come to me and say, Brian, I do have some questions for you, and you're respectful, I will be completely respectful to you. I don't hate people. Um, the worst Catholic, the most high-ranking Jesuit, the Black Pope, could walk in here today and say, I'd like to sit down and talk to you about the Bible. What does the Bible actually say? If he's respectful, I'm going to be respectful to him. Some transvestite, sex pervert, you know, whatever, whatever, comes and says, hey, I'd like to ask you some questions about the Bible. And they come in sincerity. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be respectful to them and show them a spirit of love. Again, that's a Bible-believing standard. Okay, hopefully I've answered your questions. Uh, thank you very much for those questions.